Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Columbus this Sunday, September 20th. We are an open-minded spiritual community working to help people lead lives of justice, love, learning, and hope. We come together so that we can be filled with this hope and with kindness and much needed resiliency and courage. In all this, love surrounds us. As we see so much change and turbulence around us, just know that love is still there. As the stars are still shining on a stormy night, so love is constant and holds us. We are so glad that you have come to this place as just tuning in to this hour links us to one another. So I ask this morning that you pause, breathe deeply, and let go of all the chaos surrounding us for just this hour. We begin by lighting the chalice, our symbol of reason, tolerance, and freedom, mixed with respect, compassion, and love. If you are visiting this morning, hang in there. I'm not the whole show. I'm the service leader. I sew the parts of this service together so that we can reach out to your spiritual needs as well as inform our members as to what's happening at the fellowship. For example, here's a list of announcements for this week. The discussion group meets every Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock via Zoom. There may be a topic to discuss, but we find that listening to each other's voice and seeing familiar faces plays a large part in this get-together. An email is sent to every fellowship member and friend each week with a link inviting all to join us. So, see you there. On Friday, the lunch group meets. Again, a topic or topics may be explored, but it, it's more of a social get-together. If you wish to join, contact Ed Wilson or Bill Harlan. The Women's Book Club continues to meet, but is limited to the first six women who sign up due to COVID restrictions. We're meeting in the pavilion at 9.30 on Tuesday the 22nd, this coming Tuesday. The contact person for the meeting is Michelle, Michelle Majette. The book this month is The Giver of Stars by Jojo Boyes. I say that, I should say, that if more than six women would like to take part, a second meeting can be arranged, so contact Michelle. It's a great book, by the way. I really enjoyed it. This Tuesday is Voter Registration Day nationwide. If you haven't registered to vote in Georgia, or are uncertain if you are registered, please check it out and get registered and vote. Vote in person or by absentee ballot. Absentee ballots will be going out within the next few weeks if you requested one. Voting has already started in some early voting places. So get your socks on and go vote. This may be the most important election up and down the ticket in your lifetime. You can read more on the UUA website about the ongoing project called UU The Vote. You'll find suggestions on hands-on participation during the election, such as being a poll worker. Please be active in this important endeavor. It's, it's what UUs do. And this announcement from Susan Stevenson, our uh, Chair of Social Action, who keeps us abreast of actions we might take in reference to unimaginable loss and injustice in our country. Today, she asks that we help the survivors and the overall recovery effort of recent hurricanes and unprecedented West Coast fires. Beware of scammers, though, who solicit your donation on social media or via telephone. 
She asks that you check with organizations like Charity Navigator or the Better Business Bureau to verify the groups before donating. Please resist the urge to send stuff. According to the Red Cross, cash is the best way to help organizations provide the supplies that they need on their scene. And that is what you need to know. Those are the announcements. Remember to get your announcements to Brenda early in the week. Danielle Neal will now share a brief reading with us that touches on the topic of her talk, which will come later this morning. Danielle? Thank you. I would like to start with a reading uh, called Freedom to Doubt by Paul Stephen Dodenhoff. The freedom to doubt, to question, to be content to live in mystery is central to the liberal religious tradition. Like the process of evolution itself, the path that we follow, our practice, it's not easy or simple. It isn't without its dead ends or its disappointments. It doesn't guarantee that all of our conclusions will be final or that we'll ever find an answer to all of our questions. But also, like the process of evolution, it is filled with great expressions of beauty and awe that are sometimes born of great struggle and at other times come as unexpected grace. Thank you and have a good Sunday. I am so looking forward to your talk. <laughs> but first, our seven principles. Our principles sum up the core values that Unitarian, Universaliz Unitarian Universalism holds as moral guides. They are drawn from sources as diverse as science, poetry, scripture, and personal experiences. They are, number one, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Two, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Three, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. Four, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Five, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Six, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And seven, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. This morning I will light, I will take the light from the chalice flame that holds us in this circle of love and bring to light the joys and concerns that personally touch our fellowship members. First, as a former teacher, my heart goes out to all the young mask wearing kids and their teachers and administrators and their beleaguered parents who are braving a new world of education. School dur during a pandemic requires resilience and courage. And I'll light a candle to all the older members who, uh, we have who are living alone. We haven't forgotten you. Please know that it's okay to reach out to any of us just for a little conversation. It, it'll make us all feel better. And thanks to all of you who are making calls to check on our members. Um, I will light a candle for John Land. Just know, John, that we love you like family and are sure you will come through the treatments a winner coming back to entertain us all. I would li light a candle for Steve De Felici Antonio, who is mourning the loss this past week of his brother, John. And a joy. As I look around this room, I see men and women determined to bring the warmth of fellowship to you. I see David Rush on sound, Kenny Gray on lighting, Whitaker Locke at the piano, Bill Harlan running around waving his hands, and Danielle, yay Danielle. And that doesn't include all the other volunteers who are giving of their time and talent to keep us afloat. Brenda Stevens heads up that list, and I'm thinking about Hal too. 
And last, I'll light a candle for all of you with heavy hearts going through hardships that I, I haven't touched on this morning. So here we are, together in this crazy lifetime. Let's be lifted up with the words of our Celebration of Life toast. If you don't have a cup in your hand right now, it's time for a little acting. <laughs> so lift your cups. We celebrate life. We celebrate life with its beauty and its pain. We lift these cups in tribute to the achievements of human minds and hands, and in sensitivity to the frustrations of misfortune and heartache. Not fixing blame or credit for the outcome of chance, sensing the risk, savoring the joy, sharing it all. Knowing of the, of the certainty of death and remembering the value of each moment. We drink this toast in celebration to this time, to the future, to each other, to the throbbing of the earth and sea and sky with life. Say this with me. We drink this toast in celebration of life. Does this look familiar? Even though you are not passing the basket in person, we ask that you help fill the basket from home. Your gift is critical to the mission and vitality of our UU Fellowship. Just as your home expenses continue, our fellowship has ongoing expenses that must be met and cannot be put off. I know you're being asked to contribute to candidates and causes, and that's important but we are reaching out to ask that you keep your UU donations up to date as well. Please consider doing it now. You can mail checks payable to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Columbus at P.O. Box 698, Fortson, Georgia, 31808. Remember, we don't uh, receive mail at our street address. Or you can donate online through PayPal. There's more information on making a donation at our website at uucolumbusga.org. <clears throat> Sign up to PayPal. It'll be easier going forward. Uh, if you have any questions, talk to Ron Ussery, who continues his work as our treasurer. You can also make a lasting legacy using your will to make a bequest to the fellowship. And while you get caught up, Whitaker will play Bach's invention in A minor. Whitaker? <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Witt. And now, Danielle. Danielle Neal is a member of our fellowship. She's also an adjunct professor of bioanthropology at Columbus State University, where she teaches and conducts research focusing on human remains. Danielle is originally from Massachusetts, where she earned a bachelor's degree in archaeology and history. She traveled the U.S. as an archaeologist until she returned to school to earn a master's degree at the University of Southern Mississippi. In addition to teaching and research, Danielle consults with local police to help identify human remains. She assists the Muscogee County Public Library with teen and adult forensic programs. And she lectures on various anthropo anthropological did I say that? Anthropological topics. Oh, and she's also writing a textbook. However, her greatest joy is spending time with her husband, Jason, and their three sons and two daughters. It's fair to say it's pretty busy at her house during this pandemic. Her talk is titled, Evolution and the Religious Mind. As my reading alluded to, my topic tonight is the evolution of the religious mind. As Paul Donenhoff points out, evolution is filled with great expressions of beauty and awe that are sometimes born of great struggle, because at its core, evolution is a struggle, one where the individual with the best traits for their environment survive, while others are sadly lost. When it comes to humans, these traits are not just the physical, but also the material and the cognitive. Human ancestors not only evolved to walk upright and to manipulate objects, but also to think symbolically, act socially, and comprehend causality. Some argue this could have been the perfect storm of traits that allowed for humans to create religion, and it all stemmed in the brain prior to 50,000 years ago. In addition, evolutionary changes would have favored larger brains as a means of cementing group cohesion among early savannah hunters. According to Dunbar's theory, the relative size of the neocortex of any species correlates with a number of social, social variables that include social group size and complexity of mating behaviors. In chimpanzees, the neocortex occupies 50% of the brain whereas in modern humans, it occupies 80% of the brain. After the cementation of evolutionary changes, larger brains would have enabled reflection on the inevitability of personal morality. As I explained in an earlier talk on morality and nature, non-humans also exhibit morality. However, Franz de Waal points out that humans enforce the moral code much more rigorously than non-humans. Psychologist Matt Rossano argues that religion emerged after morality and built upon morality by expanding the social scrutiny of individual behavior to include supernatural agents. This could be because our social institutions are more, are more complex and coupled with ever-growing populations required a supernatural punisher with the assumption that mean gods make good people. By including ever-watchful ancestors, spirits, and gods in the social realm, humans discovered an effective strategy for restraining selfishness and building more cooperative groups. It seems as if most religions have gods or goddesses that become angry and vengeful if their human subjects displease them. For instance, the oldest recorded religion, Hinduism, has the goddess of destruction of evil, Christianity has the Old Testament with pillars of salt, plagues, and wrath. And Judaism has Yom Kippur, a literal day of atonement. 
explained by Lewis Black as a day that is depressing on a level you can't begin to imagine. These kinds of gods and dogma have been the status quo for thousands of years, and they've seemed to have worked. Over time, they became the prevailing authority in answering unsolvable problems. They provided comfort in a world when people needed it and created group cohesion. Evolutionarily speaking, religion and the traits of religion fit the social environment in which they existed. But it seems as if the social environment that we live in today is changing, not just locally, but globally. In a 2018 study uh, done by the Pew Research Center, out of 106 countries surveyed, young adults are significantly less likely to be affiliated with a religious group in 41 of those countries. Looked at another way, young adults are more likely to be religiously unaffiliated. Another study suggested that this disconnect could, in part, be from societal shifts. Changing views about the relationship between morality and religion appear to have convinced many young parents that religious institutions are simply irre irrelevant or unnecessary for their children. One woman was quoted as saying, in some ways, I think many religious organizations are not good models for moral teachings, end quote. If millennials do not return to religion and instead begin raising a new generation with no religious background, religion over time uh, could be evolved out as it is being selected against. There also appears to be a shift in the social and political messages people want to hear, evident in, in the BLM movement, immigrant rights protests, and pushback against mainstream media and the negative messaging coming out of the White House. Pastor John pa Pavlovitz summed it up nicely when he posted, I'm tired of hatred, like really tired. I'm tired of having to once again channel the adrenaline to confront a new onslaught of real and manufactured emergencies. I'm tired of trying to convince professed followers of Jesus that they're supposed to care about other people. I'm tired of seeing stories of newly emboldened bigots showing up as neighbors, elementary school teachers, local politicians, and coffee shop patrons because they feel a kindred, embittered spirit in the White House." End quote. This point is not an anomaly. It's what people all over the country are saying, and based on these sentiments, people would be less likely to attend an institution that promotes division or a supernatural punisher. However, not all religions revolve around a mean God or demonizing actions to make good people. Some, including Unitarian Universalism, promote an all-encompassing community where every person has inherent worth and dignity. UUs also value social justice by being at the forefront of the civil rights movement and by committing to Black Lives Matter, immigrant justice, LGBTQ rights, environmental issues, and local charities. These traits, which mimic growing national sentiment, have proven to be a likely reason UU membership is declining slower than many mainstream religions. In fact, UU World reported in 2018 the first member increase since 2008. In a world where religious affiliation is declining across the board, UUs might have to experience great struggles in order to show the world that path we follow is filled with great expressions of beauty and awe. Thank you. As we prepare to leave, Take a look again at our chalice, remembering that it represents reason, tolerance, and freedom mixed with respect, compassion, and love. As I extinguish the chalice here, keep this flame glowing in your heart and let it light your path as you go through the week.
and as you go forward to vote in these confusing times, this from James chapter one, be doers of the word and not merely hearers. Those who would look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. And now, would everyone rise up off your couch in body and spirit for the closing words, and please say them with me. With unity of spirit, we go our ways in universal fellowship until we meet again. Go in love. <laughs>